Assuming the motor is a modified standard, you can find the standard motor it's based on and use it as a template. Go into rotary. I have a resolver based motor under Parker US. Mine is based on a 233FR in the BE series. Right click from the motor library and use as template. In step one, you can name your motor. These will appear under user defined motors instead of Parker US or Parker Europe motors. I can put my full part number here. Let's just assume it's one, two, three. I can also add a comment here if I want to name that X axis winder. Each time you use use as template, it'll always set the name as copy of and then the standard motor part number. So if you do multiple motor files, it'll always have the same name. The last one created is on top of the list. If you ever connect to another drive and do an upload, if it's a custom motor, it'll also import that motor file. You can look at the summary screen to see the differences, but in the drive configuration it'd be difficult to determine which is correct, so it's good practice to go, go ahead and rename it. On step two, has the motor's pull count, the motor voltage constant. This says volts per thousand RPM, and it is the peak of the sine wave. Rotary inertia is set in kilogram millimeters squared. The continuous stall current is at zero speed, is in amps RMS, and is in milliamps. The peak current is set based on a percentage of the rated current which is at rated speed. Time at peak current is how long the motor can handle the peak current in milliseconds. The maximum mechanical speed is typically the bearing limit but you can also set it as a maximum speed for the feedback device. The resistance is in milliohms and the inductance is in microhenries. For saturation and deflexing values leave this unchecked for permanent magnet synchronous motors. This is an error in the database for U.S. motors and will be corrected in a future revision of the database. That is only used for induction motors. If this is a standard winding, you do not need to change this unless the motor is force cooled. You can change these as needed based on the motor specifications. Step 3 allows an optional maximum DC voltage. Thus, if the motor is rated for 160 volt DC, like an SM231AE, but the drive can take 230 volts AC, this would prevent a user from enabling the drive with 230 volts AC connected and damaging the motor. This would cause a 3210 DC link voltage exceeds limit error. This motor is a standard winding which can take 230 volts AC, so I'm not going to change that. Step 4, 5, and 6 are for the motor's current torque and speed at 230, 400, and 460 volts AC. The speed limit is in RPM, the torque is in milli newton meters, and the current is in milliamps. Again, current is in amps RMS per phase. If the motor is not rated for the higher voltage, leave those unchecked. If this is a standard winding, you do not need to change these unless the motor is force cooled. You can enter those from Galaxy spreadsheets from your ATC. This motor isn't rated for 400 or 460 volts AC, so I'm going to leave those unchecked. On step 7 is set based on the motor's over temperature sensor. If the motor doesn't have an over temperature sensor like the BE16, you can click note over temperature monitoring. This screen you input the motor's thermal time constant. This is an industry standard specification for the motor and is the time it takes to reach 63% of the motor's final temperature given a constant power input. If you don't have this, you'll need to contact the motor manufacturer. The sensor can be either PTC, which is a positive thermal coefficient, or an NTC type. For PTC, you input the resistance at the over temperature. If it's only a switch, check the box. If this is based on a standard Parker motor, you do not need to change this. Go ahead and click Next. Note, if you're looking at the motor temperature in the optimization screen under object 684.2 C3 dot status temperature motor, this presumes the motor has a KTY 84-130 thermistor. If it doesn't, then the temperature will not be correct. As standard, North America motors do not use this type of thermistor. 
Step 8 is used to set if the motor has a fail-safe brake or not. If it does, then you can set the set, which is the close, and the release, which is the open time delays. My motor doesn't have one, so I'm going to leave this unchecked. Note that the maximum current draw out of the brake output on the X3 connector is 1.6 amps. If your motor's brake's current draw is higher, then you'll need to run the brake output to a relay. Step 9 sets the motor feedback. The radial button at the top selects the feedback type. These are straightforward except for the Syncos. That's a trademark name for Stegman's Hyperface Absolute Encoders. This shouldn't be confused with the Heidenhain indat, which is also a sine cosine type feedback signal, or a 1 volt peak to peak sine cosine encoder. Note the Compax 3s have different hardware for the different feedback options. If we take a look on the online help file, the C3 Servo Manager software, the online help file, is a Microsoft help file format, so it makes it easy to search. If you go into the search tab and type feedback, and press enter. You'll see motors and feedback systems supported. If you double click on this, you can see the different types of feedbacks that are compatible with the Compax 3. The resolver is used on the F10 option. The F11 supports the Stegman Syncos Absolute Encoders. The F12 supports the analog hall sensors, sine, cosine, 1 volt peak to peak, incremental encoders, and then also the quadrature TTL encoders. The F12 also supports the INDAT 2.1 and 2.2 absolute encoder types. Now back to the motor manager. On step 9, down below you can see the commutation angle, which is the resolver offset angle, or for the absolute encoder is the angle between the encoder and the motor phases then the commutation direction, the feedback sensor direction, and then for the resolver, the number of poles. This will change based on what the feedback type is selected.